if everyone thinks I'm confident and I'm always acting like I'm confident, then maybe... Maybe I accidentally became confident. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Jeff Callahan, founder of Become More Compelling. And you're listening to Become More Compelling Radio, the podcast where we take the tactics, the mindsets, and the best practices from social skills and charisma experts. And uh, I pass them along to you on a silver platter so that you can use them to improve your own life when it comes to connecting with your fellow humans. I'm so excited. Today, I'm joined by Marsha Shandor. Marsha is the founder of YesYesMarsha.com, where she shows creatives and entrepreneurs how to tell their personal stories and as a networking mentor, how to build meaningful business and career connections that move their careers forward faster. She's been featured on BBC, Forbes, The Art of Charm, and The Muse. She's also a storytelling coach. As the organizer and host and story coach for True Stories Told Live, Toronto's biggest storytelling show, she's coached over 100 storytellers, taking their personal stories from a confused mess to a compelling stage or video piece. She herself has told stories everywhere from the Toronto Storytelling Festival to Portland's World Domination Summit to a live audience of 3,000 people where she, where she is now the conference's official story coach. She also has a book out called Off the Mic. And I'm a fan of stand-up comedy. And this book is about stand-up comics creative processes, how they, uh, how they go about writing their jokes, how they deal with hecklers. Uh, she actually interviews multiple, multiple comics. I think there's something like 42 interviews in the book. Eddie Izzard, among many other talented comedians, so definitely check that out as well. In this conversation, we talk about how to craft and identify stories in your own life and how you can make those stories extremely compelling. And we also talk about some of the pitfalls to avoid when it comes to storytelling. So this is, I believe it's a crucial area that is often overlooked when it it comes to social skills and charisma. If you've ever felt like, I can't tell a good story, people's eyes glaze over when I start talking, Uh, We have some extremely valuable tips and extremely powerful mindsets to take you to the next level when it comes to your storytelling. Also, Marsha has a free gift for Become More Compelling readers, which is a guide to uh, remembering people's names. And this is something I struggled with for years. And I actually use a technique that that she teaches. I won't spoil it, but you need to check it out. That's going to be in the show notes. That's going to give you the superpower of remembering anyone's name. And I also have a free gift. If you haven't gotten a chance to check it out, it's a free guide on creating fantastic first impressions and right things to focus on when it comes to meeting someone new for the first time. And that's going to be in the show notes as well. So without further ado, let's dive right in. I think you're absolutely going to love this one. I'm so excited to be here. I love talking about storytelling. Awesome. So we were actually just talking before I hit the record button about uh, a really amazing story that you have around snakes, uh, which is which is a weird kind of lead in. Um, but I'll, I'll definitely be be linking uh, to the YouTube video where you go into to the whole thing. But we're just kind of thinking about stories and, and how how stories can be so impactful. And let me just ask you this. Why is it important to to, to have a few good stories in your Batman utility belt? Well, story, oh, the reason I'm so obsessed with stories and storytelling, and particularly like spoken storytelling as opposed to like written story or brand story or whatever, is, uh, well, I found out some of the science behind why I love it. I always thought for years that it's just that we have this primal response to it because that's how we pass down information for years. You know, long before we even didn't have the internet, we didn't have books for most of our evolution. So most of our information got passed down through stories. So I think it hits some kind of primal nerve there. But also, so our brain responds completely differently when we're telling stories. So when I tell you a list of facts, the parts of your brain that will light up are the data processing parts, which are called Broca's area and Wernicke's area. But when I tell you a story, the parts of your brain that light up are the parts of your brain that would be lighting up if you were in the story. So if I tell you about stacking a load of chairs or carrying something heavy or, or, or you know, doing some kind of um, physical puzzle, then the motor parts of your brain will light up. If I tell you about eating a hamburger or touching a really soft piece of velvet, then the sensory parts of your brain that will light up. And the coolest thing is, is that me then as a storyteller and you as a listener, our brains go in sync with each other. Yes, I, you know, it's funny, as soon as you said that, I immediately thought of like the great stories that I've heard and how they immediately like, it's almost like 
Uh, well, if I could have any superpower, it would be it would be the ability to teleport, and that's what stories do in a sense is right. they teleport you into what it's like to be another person. Totally, totally. So I run a storytelling show in Toronto called True Stories Told Live, and um, and one of the things that I love about it so much is that. All the people in that room, like 180 people, all get to have all of these experiences. You know, they get to, in a t within 10 minutes, they get to spend a summer in BC tree planting and they get to like have a weird, I think I'm God, nervous breakdown in their basement in Vancouver. <laughs> and they get to like have their first day at work when they're 20 years old and really shy and have weirdly smelly armpits. Like all these things that they actually would never would get to experience. It's like they get to do that. And that's so powerful. And it also you know, is the way that you can kind of instantly emotionally connect with someone, which I think is powerful because connection is powerful, but also it like lets you know who your guys are, whether it's in business or, you know, in personal. Sometimes people tell stories and I'm like, man, that is a good story, but I do not want to be friends with you. <laughs> and then other times people tell stories and I'm like, I want to hang out with you all the time. <laughs> hmm. Now, actually, I, I have a question about that. So, and, and this is a personal question for you, if you don't mind. I love so, you, you take those two people, you, you take the person that's like, that's telling you a story and you get that sense of, oh, I really don't want to be friends with you. What, what's the difference between that and the person who's telling the story and you're like, oh, we are, we are soulmates. I think it's like who your guys are. Like for me, I'm very, even though I'm from England, which is a nation of cynics, I'm very positive. And when people are really cynical and down on everything, I just feel like, dude, I don't want to hang out with you. You're a huge bummer. But equally... I have so many Brit friends. I mean, one of my friends in the UK just got told off for being too American when he signed off an email, have a great weekend. <laughs> like, that's the nation of people that I am from. And so for a lot of them, they would hear one of my stories where I'm like, everything was amazing, and then this thing was amazing, and they'd be like, eh, she's so positive, I don't want to hang out with her. So I think it's like, it's not about good and bad, it's just about who's your, who are your guys and who aren't your guys. Yeah, I, I think that's so true. It's, it, it's funny you say that because I actually, I did a, a blog post about there was one of our friends who had a habit of disagreeing with everything everyone says and it was draining to hang out with him and I posted the blog post and then like like I redacted his name and I immediately get a bunch of friends who are texting me and saying is it me <laughs> uh, and I'm like no 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 it wasn't you and what's funny is one of my friends said that um, I wasn't there that night but this person who constantly disagreed with everyone he actually uh, he was about to go into his normal thing and one of our other mutual friends just said, I want you to stop for a second. I want you to consider what I said and then I want you to respond. <laughs> and what happened? And, and he, he actually, like, he just paused for a little bit and then he stuck out his hand to shake my other friend's hand because he had been, the pattern had been interrupted for him. So he actually got to step outside of himself and see, like, his behavior. And uh, and that's something that I never knew about. It was, it was like, the, the uh, secret part of, of that story. So... It, it's, it's really cool how sometimes uh, we don't know what we don't know sometimes about, uh, yeah. about ourselves. And if we're just given that little bit of opportunity to step outside, then we can really view ourselves. And I think stories actually are, are a great way to, to actually accomplish that. Well, I would, I would add that actually that could happen with storytelling. Like I, I'm, I'm Russian, and when you're Russian, there's kind of two requirements, really. One is that at festivals and me special meals, you'll eat, drink a thimble full of neat vodka. And the other is that you're a storyteller because everybody's telling stories. And so I grew up around stories. And then with my friends, you know, for me, it's so important that when I tell you a story that you're there, that you can, you know, taste the tastes and smell the smells. But whenever I was telling stories, my friends would just be like, oh, Marsha, get on with it. Because I'm going, you know, instead of saying I walked there, I'm like, I lifted my foot above the pavement. The small feats of grass kind of came through the cracks between them. You know, I have to put all of the detail. And then actually the way that I learned to do it was partly from my friends constantly saying, please, can you just skimp some of the detail and calling me out on it. Um, but then the other way that I learned was I went on the radio and I was on music radio for 15 years and I had to basically shrink my stories from 20 minutes down to 20 seconds because after 20 seconds the jingle kicks in and you have to stop talking because someone else is talking. But, um, but yeah, that is to say I feel like it's good to call people out on stuff if you do it with love. Yes, and that's, and that's the best way to approach any feedback situation. Uh, it's so funny that you say details because I actually have written down he here in my notes the uh, detail paradox. Like, how much is too much? We're going to get into some of that too because I, I, I believe I have a habit of maybe going into too much detail when it comes to uh, stories. And I can imagine being, being on radio for a while, it, 
the jingle the the jingle will start playing. Yeah, yeah, and in actually the thing seconds. the thing that's interesting about being on the radio as well is it's not just about the jingle or the vocal kicking in. It's also about the fact that people listening to music radio aren't expecting to hear a lot of speech, and so when I finally nailed it getting things from, you know, three and four minutes down to 20 seconds, I had so much more impact than I had before. It's like for my storytelling show, I sit down with all the storytellers and I coach them through the process. So I sat down with one yesterday and we spent about two and a half hours together for a 10 minute story. And I was gripped for the two and a half hours, but that's in a one-on-one -on -one situation and in a situation where I was there just to hear that story. Whereas if she stood up in front of the 180 people and told the story for two and a half hours, she would lose them because as an audience, you have a shorter attention span. And so, but I think I think that also applies to different groups of people you know with some of my friends I know I can ramble on and re with really great detail with other of them they're a bit more ADD and I need to get that story out quicker or you know if I'm standing in a room full of people I don't know I need to put a lot less detail into my story because they don't know me well enough to trust that it's going to be a good story so I need to get to the good bits as quickly as I can mm, so so it's almost like you're, you're giving them a really good link to click on and not not really in a clickbait way but in a Trust me, you're gonna enjoy the story uh, because in, in the beginning, if they don't if they don't know you or or if it's the first time that they're exposed to you, probably the number one concern that they have is, oh no, is this gonna take forever? Right. So actually, it's interesting that you should say that because I feel like one of the things that people get the most wrong when they're telling a story. Basically, here's the most important thing you need to know about telling great stories, Jeff, which if you only take one thing away from this conversation, let it be this. <laughs> um, when you're telling a story, you're making a movie inside someone's brain. And so many things that apply to movies apply to this. So for some reason, a lot of people, when they tell stories, particularly on stage, think that they should start the story like this. This is a story about life, death, divorce, and my trip to Germany. But there's two things there. One is like, it could be a boring story. Why should I bother listening? But also, you wouldn't start a movie with Tom Cruise being like, so what happens in this movie is I fight like five different bad guys and one of them has a mustache and it looks like he's going to kill me, but then actually he doesn't kill me, so it's fine. And then I win and then me and the girl kiss. Anyway, enjoy the movie because it's, first of all, it's like a weird, boring way to start. Secondly, you're throwing in loads of spoilers so we don't have the tension of knowing like, is he going to win from the bad guy or not? And thirdly, it's also, we're going to start reverse engineering. So we're watching the story being like, when did the bad guy come? You know, if you start the story saying, this is a story about life, death, and divorce, then we're like, is he going to divorce her now? When's he going to divorce her? When's it going to happen? So what you should do is start the story the way you'd start a movie, which is in action. And it doesn't have to be the main action scene. You know, you don't start the Tom Cruise movie with like the main fight with the baddies, but you probably do start with him like hanging off the edge of a cliff while the bad guy's running towards him and there's a 40 foot drop. And the reason you do is because as a movie watcher, you're like, what's going to happen? I've got to stay. And the same with storytelling. Like that's the way to kind of grab people who've just met you is to start the story with something exciting. And, and by something exciting, that could be, I sat in the car and I thought, what the hell am I doing? Why am I here? And as a listener, we're like, what's going to happen? You know, the reason that the, the, the Buzzfeed clickbait stuff works is because we hate an information gap as humans. We hate it and we need to fill it. And so if you start your story by kind of nudging that instinct in people to want to close that information gap, they're going to stay with you listening. That was, that was incredible. There's so much to pick apart in what you just said. I knew you were going to bring up the information gap. One of my favorite movies is the movie Fight Club, and it starts out... Uh, Edward Norton has a gun in his mouth and we don't know why. Right, right. And immediately they're like, what is happening? What is going on? And <laughs> but so, I feel like what's important is that it doesn't, a lot of people think, oh, but my, you know, nothing that exciting's happened to me. When I run storytelling workshops, I tell these two different stories and they're both about death because a lot of my stories are about death. And one of them is a story about like, and it, and it starts with me saying, the night that the doctor told us that my grandma was going to die, we put down mattresses on the floor of her room. Um, and the other story is me about we're talking about my uncle dying, and I basically say, and I and I and what I do is I do the first the first story all in action scene, and the second story all in voiceover. So the first story is like you know we put the mattresses down, and then I worry that she's going to die, and I climb into bed with her, and I'm very descriptive about it all. And then the second story I do it all in voiceover. So I say, you know, my uncle, he got cancer, and it was like really sad, and then he died, and I was there, but like I didn't really feel sad for a while. And it's funny sometimes with grief because you sort of like sometimes it's a bit like being depressed, but you don't always feel it. And the thing 
thing is, is that people are so much more affected. But and the second one's like much more exciting. Like he dies, I get depressed. But because I'm talking about it without any detail and without any emotion, it doesn't affect people. Whereas the first story is all about the detail and all about the mo- emotion, and that's what affects people. Like that's how if you want to make a movie inside someone's brain, that's how you do it. Is you constantly think, what did it look like? How did I feel? What did it look like? How did I feel? The most important thing in storytelling is making your listener feel the way that you felt in that moment so that they can do exactly what you and I were talking about earlier where they get to experience it and if you're doing all voiceover and all descriptive or if you're talking about all the stuff that's going to happen in the story you're not making them feel the way that you felt in that moment Mm. so from what I'm hearing and and I think this is beautiful is if you can craft your story not as an observer like you're almost option B there would be you're doing it in voiceover. It's almost like you're a member of the audience talking about you watching the movie as opposed to being being the director of that movie that you're creating in someone's head and actually being extremely descriptive and really diving extremely deep in, into uh, what the experience was like so that people can actually connect on a, on a very deep and very human level. Yeah, and I think in terms of the details, what's important are... Um, you know, there's a lot of details that aren't important. Like even that story with my granny, I didn't say we put down the sheets. The sheets were blue. They had a small stripe to them. Like it's not important that the sheets, it's important that we put the mattresses on the floor, but it's not important what the mattresses consisted of. You know, basically what you want is, you know how you have those court artists who like when someone's in court, they like draw the jury or they draw the defendant because mm-hmm. you can't have cameras in there. You kind of want to tell the story so that if someone was making a movie version of it, you could be like, yeah, that's pretty much what happened. Like, if it's irrelevant that your friend Dan had brown hair or blonde hair, then it doesn't matter what colour hair he is. But if it's very important, because later on someone says the blonde guy, then tell us that he's a blonde guy. Like, that's important. So with detail, it's partly thinking, what has to be in here for the story to make sense? But then on the other hand, sometimes you want to have details just because having visual images is delightful. Like, when you make someone create visual images in their brain, it bonds them to you in a crazy way. This is something I learned from radio because when you're on music radio, the urge is just to go, that's a brilliant song, that's a brilliant song, and that's a brilliant song, and that gets boring after a while. Whereas if you can say, you know, when Taylor Swift recorded this, she actually had a broken leg, and so in between takes she was having to hobble from, you know, the piano to the restroom or whatever, then every time they listen to that song, they're going to imagine Taylor Swift hobbling around on her broken... I made that up, by the way. (laughs) (laughs) Hobbling around on her broken foot, and that creates a visual image, and then they think of you, or they think of the radio station, and it bonds them to you. So sometimes you want to have details just to have visuals in there because it's delicious and to make them feel like they were there but you don't need every single tiny detail generally I feel like it's important if you're not someone who's naturally a good storyteller I do think it's worth practicing storytelling and I think it's worth practicing them out how to an empty room sometimes and what you want to do is always think what can I cut out of this but still get the essence of the story you know that's how I got the stories from 20 minutes down to 20 seconds when I was on the radio. That's how, when I work with my clients now, sometimes we need to get their story down to 10 minutes or five minutes for a speaking gig. Sometimes we need to get it down to 30 seconds because it's part of a pitch that they're doing. And so what we're doing in those instances is always thinking, what can we take out and still get across the essence of the story? And it's hard because there's bits that you like. I told the story on stage at Portland's World Domination Summit a couple of years ago, and it's an audience of 3,000 people, and the stories had to be a minute and a half long. And I was telling a story about, I ran a solo marathon. So I was supposed to run the New York Marathon. It got cancelled. So I basically just like ran a marathon on my own. It was amazing. Everyone thought I was a hero and I had a great time. But anyway, so I'm telling the story and I've got a minute and a half and they wanted me to put like an inspirational message in there. And there was all these bits to the story that were great. Like at mile 18, my knee gave way and suddenly I couldn't run anymore. And I was thinking, oh my God, you know, I'm letting all these people down, these people who came to cheer me on. I'm not going to get there in time to see them. And all these people who followed me on Twitter and then my friend texted me and said oh my god you're winning and I thought I'm the only person running this race I am winning (laughs) and I wanted to get that in because that's such a great bit of the story but actually I realized it wasn't essential to what I was trying to tell like it was a nice added extra but I could still get rid of it in literature sometimes they call it killing your darlings and that's what it can feel like but sometimes You've just got to get rid of stuff. But one thing I would say on the editing is usually it's better to get rid of an entire chunk of a story than it is just to skim detail. Like what you want to... So, so, you know, 
sometimes you need the voiceover or the montage to get from one action scene to a next. I can tell you about me and my granny on the floor with the mattresses. But then if I want to tell you the next bit about, you know, at her funeral, sometimes I need a bit of voiceover to get there. I need to say, well, you know, she died and then three days passed. Or a bit of montage where I say, you know, we sat in her room for three nights and then she died and then we sat with the body and then the funeral directors came. Sorry that this is really <laughs> dark and about death. Um, but generally you want it to be action scenes as much as possible. So sometimes when you're cutting your stories down, you need to take out an entire action scene rather than just turning it into over, over, over descript, like general descriptive voiceover. Mm. So you'll, you, you might want to cut the entire action scene in, in, instead of reducing it down to sort of like the uh, Rocky montage where, where he's training and he's hitting meat and stuff like that, correct? Right, 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 exactly. But actually a really lovely example of you cutting a story down was you telling that story about your friend earlier that you said, you know, he, so I feel like you montaged by saying um, he's always really negative, everyone always has a hard time about it. You got a little bit action scene by telling us that you wrote this blog post and all these people are texting you. But then you said once time is with my friend and then my fr you know and then we're in action scene which often active dialogue is a way of doing an action scene so rather than saying she told me to shut up it's saying shut up she said and so you said you know then my friend said this to him and then you said and then the way that you described it Jeff was you said he stuck his hand out and shook his hand and just that tiny bit of detail I had a picture of your friend standing in a bar I, I kind of had a picture of like everyone going silent when your friend said <laughs> and then him sticking his hand out and everyone like cheering and raising their glasses or something I'm sure it wasn't quite as dramatic as that but I but I had a picture there because you did a really good job of going from action scene voiceover back to action scene I yeah and I and I really appreciate that because uh it's it's one of those things that's so difficult and and, and I want to call out the notion of killing your darlings like you, you you took someone yesterday and you were with them for two and a half hours trying to get them down to a, a ten minute story. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> just by definition, you're not going to be able to include everything, and it's often it's the hardest part of writing. It's the hardest part of uh, communicating is sometimes crystallizing that message. Something I, I also want to call out what I'm noticing is a lot of emotion in your voice. Like you're, you're a very expressive person. Uh, <laughs> I am. Anyone that follows you know, knows this. It's not a blog. Uh, but I think that's something else that, that separates average storytellers or maybe even good storytellers to fantastic ones, to great ones, is they can communicate with the intangibles, which would be the emotion, the expression in their voice. Can you speak to that? Right, and um, it's interesting you should say this actually because it came up a lot with the storyteller I was with yesterday. Um, so one of the things uh, that I learned, there's an amazing storyteller in Toronto called Sage Turtle, um, and I learned so much from her. And one of the things that I learned from her is wherever possible, you want to show, don't tell. So rather than saying... I felt sad, you want to say, you know, there were tears in my eyes and my breath caught in the back of my throat and I felt like there was a, a, a lump in my chest. That's a lot more powerful. And similarly, you can say, my voice went all high, or just make your voice go all high. And it'll have the same effect, but much more powerful and get there a lot quicker and save you, you know, whatever that is, five words, four words. <laughs> Um, so yeah, I feel like wherever you can be expressive when it's when it's needed to be, you know, don't be like, and then I went downstairs and there was, you know, for the sake of it. But um, but yeah, if you if you what you want to do is again, you want to be in the story as much as possible. So if there's a bit where you're excited, then then remember what it feels like to be excited. If there was a bit where you were really sad, you know, I didn't say the night that my granny was well, the night we found out she was dying. I, I, I say it by saying the night the doctor told us she was dying because that's the appropriate tone of voice because that was how I felt at the time. Yeah, and, and it's so fascinating how just just the tone of your voice can you can you can go really low and be very personal, and that's the if we're if we're thinking about like the I guess the vocal component almost as like italics bold underline you can, yeah yeah you can slow down and that it does the exact same things as being really excited it's the same thing you're still bolding but in a different way because it's different than than what surrounds it mm -hmm. and I'm always one of the things I'm always telling my storytellers is don't be afraid of silence don't be afraid of silence and don't be afraid of it um, for three different things. One is like sometimes just to drag out the tension. You know, if we're all on the edge of our seats, help us feel that delicious feeling. Sometimes just to show a state of mind. You know, if, you, if you're flabbergasted and you don't have anything to say, 
leave it quiet. And then also it's useful for the passage of time. If you want to say, you know, blah, 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 I've finished telling a story about when you're five years old. And then you now want to tell a story about when you're 25. You don't have to say, and then I grew up and then another 20 years happened. You can just leave a pause and go, so I'm 25 years old, you know, it's 20 years later. And I'm at home. And so, yeah, definitely don't be afraid of silence. And it's, it's really funny that you bring that up because on my wall taped in front of me, I, I have the words embrace the silence written. Awesome. <laughs> because me personally, like I, well, it's taken me a long time to start to give the silence an awkward hug, uh, <laughs> as it were. But I feel like I'm doing a lot better now than in years past because I would want to fill that, that uh, you know, the, the sort of silence in the vacuum. Um, Dude, I so much spent- power. I spent 15 years working in radio where one second, like one second of silence to you is like 25 minutes to me. (laughs) I am terrified of silence. It's only really in the last couple of years that I'm learning that it's okay to be quiet with people. And weirdly, the, the upshot of that is often I have conversations with people where I think, God, that was torturous. I was like really straining to keep the conversation going. And they think, wow, me and Marsha just clicked. The conversation was easy because I've heard all of these silences that they can't even hear and then I've jumped in immediately to fill them. So yeah, I totally hear you on being able to not fill every second with silence. And I think probably the only time I really master it is when I'm telling a story and not in conversation. Right. And I, w- I would actually like to ask you this, which you said in, in the last couple of years is when you, you really become a lot more comfortable with silence. What was the turning point for you? Or when did you start noticing that, that you were... You know what? It, was exa- it, was ex- it wasn't even that. It was that. It was that I kept having conversations with, with people where I would find it extraordinarily hard work and they would think that we'd had this like special moment because we'd connected so well. <laughs> Interesting. So, <laughs> so I thought, well, maybe I should just stop being comfortable with silence. I love that because what you did is you, you actually ignored your kind of inner monologue and you went external and you said like, well, you know, all these people think that we're having great conversations. So that must be true because that's the experience that I'm, that I'm giving people. And, right. and then only, only then when you examined the actual results that you were getting, did you realize like, okay, apparently I'm getting a lot better at silence, even though it still <laughs> might feel like the iceberg or the duck on the lake. So yeah, I absolutely no, love I, that. I find it, I find it really hard. Um, but I think it's also like, Part of that also for me was just having boundaries and realizing I don't have to rescue everyone all of the time. Like it's not my responsibility to always keep the conversation going. It's not my responsibility to make sure that everyone is super comfortable and fine, which again, I think is like one of the things when you're Russian is that it's pretty common for the doorbell to go and you open the door and there to be some random stranger you've never seen before standing there saying, hi, I'm your sister's friends, dog's previous owners, former teachers, next door neighbor. Can I come and live with you rent free for six months? And you say, come in, we'll have soup. So there's just always people in the house and there's usually people of multiple nationalities in the house. And I very much was brought up to say it, it, it with, with the kind of attitude of like, it doesn't matter if the dinner is burnt. It doesn't matter if the kitchen floor is dirty. What matters is that the conversation keeps going and everyone's having a nice time. So I think my silence and, and maybe my storytelling is born from that. You know, it's interesting that, that you say that you felt that kind of responsibility to make everyone comfortable and to keep the conversation flowing because I mean, I can speak for myself. Like I felt that pull a lot of times and and I only feel like now that I'm starting to feel more comfortable, just, just allowing the dust to settle, but it can be so difficult. And and I think that's something that I want, I know it's a lot, a lot of my readers carry, carry that weight around where, where they feel like they might have to, uh, single-handedly like the incredible Hulk, you know, pick up the end, the entire conversation and keep it going, keep it going when that's, in reality, that's not the case. There's actually a really good. I'm sure you've read the Charisma Myth by Olivia Fox. Yes, okay. she's amazing. I love uh, it. Yeah, it's pretty awesome. But she, there's an an excellent chapter, in where she talks about being a charismatic listener and being able to slow down and after someone finishes speaking, to just pause and absorb what they say. Mm-hmm. Yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah. so easy to write and so easy to read. So difficult to do. Mm-hmm. Exactly, exactly. Although, you know, Jeff, flip side of 
constantly feeling like you have to be the one who rescues everything. You and I are like the networking experts now because <laughs> we've just been running around making everyone feel comfortable and then now we know like which things work. So add the boundaries to that and add the Olivia Fox Caban power pauses and uh, we're going to be unstoppable. <laughs> yes, it, it'll, be, it'll be like Transformers and Mighty Mo from Power Rangers and all, all kinds <laughs> exactly. of awesome things. Exactly. God bless getting older. <laughs> Well, I, I've been waiting for a long time for the '90s to come back in vogue, and it's finally happened. So I feel like I'm <laughs> I feel like I'm back home finally. Awesome. But I I definitely want to ask you this: is that with your because you've coached a lot of people when it comes to storytelling. Hmm. Um. What are some some uh, learns that you've had around um, sort of I guess the bad habits that people have, or or just kind of I don't want to label anything, but just the, the habits that people have that uh, that almost the invisible scripts that are guiding them towards being non-effective storytellers. Does that you know sense? what? It really, yeah, it makes perfect sense. And it really, really, really comes back to the movie analogy where most people try and tell stories in voiceover or maybe montage and they don't realize that it's all about action scenes. Um, I So this year I've now become the story coach for World Domination Summit. And so I coached a bunch of these attendee storytellers who all had to tell their stories in a minute and a half. And other than two of them, Everybody tried to make the minute and a half pure voiceover. Everybody tried to make it, you know, this is what I think, and don't you find that this can happen, and blah, blah, blah. And it's totally not compelling. And what we did was we managed to get the messages that they want to get across, because at WDS, the stories always have a message. We managed to get the messages of what they, have, what they wanted to get across, but to couch them in these action scenes so that people actually cared and were invested in these people because they could see the visuals and because they got to have those experiences alongside them, you know, so that all the different parts of their brains lit up that would have lit up if they were actually acting out the story. So then the message came a lot, along a lot more clearly. And because they, they had like emotionally connected with these people, they were more interested in their message than they would have been if they just said, oh, you guys should like be good to people and do good turns for strangers or whatever it was. You should, you should totally just like adopt some cats and yeah <laughs> but, 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 but whereas if you said you know so there's the whatever minky hobbled along on his three legs and <laughs> no sort of tiny meow escaped his dry lips and people on the street ignored him but then one old lady crossed the whatever okay saw, saw him and darted across the road and picked him up and took him home and slowly as the weeks passed minky's fur began to grow back whatever it is i'm making this up <laughs> I, I i'm i'm totally engaged i want to find totally out what happens to minky. minky right exactly um but but it's just you know just putting so so that's the number one mistake that i'd say that people make is they try and make it all voiceover and you want to be action scene action scene and they try and describe things you know in in sort of cerebrally rather than just showing them so rather than saying i you know rather than explaining what it was to feel sad or they'll be like he was really eccentric whereas that could mean 10 different things to 10 different people whereas if you say you know he he never wore shoes and he was afraid of open doors that tells you so much more about that character than he was really eccentric does yes i just think of like wearing kleenex boxes on yeah. on it on his feet or something like exactly. that. Exactly, but like this guy, you know, the guy in the story yesterday didn't do that, but that's what you would assume, or I would assume that they would be like very loud and have a thick foreign accent because that's what all the eccentrics in my life were like, which again, <laughs> he didn't do. And so just give a couple of descriptors and that's so much more powerful and makes the person be there so much more with you. So always, always, what did it look like? How did I feel? What did it look like? How did I feel? And then go back and edit. And one thing I would say for the editing is generally if you're telling a story out loud, try not to write it out word for word because writing kind of deadens the language. You know, you say things written down that you would never say when you were talking to someone. I had a, I had a storyteller once who'd, who'd written her story and, and she'd said, bikini clad, I rose from the balcony. And it's like you would never sit with your friends in a bar going, anyway, so bikini clad, I rose from the balcony. So don't say anything that you wouldn't say when you're talking to someone. And so rather than writing out word for word, just write bullet points. And it's the facts of your life, so you won't forget the important bits. I love that. Just just do the bullet points and everything else will kind of uh, you know drop in as it should. And, and, and here, here's something that I would love to ask you, which is, so say, say there's a situation like, we're co-coaching someone. They're uh, at a bar, and, and and they and they want to just have uh, the ability to hop in with that story, but they still want to keep their audience engaged. Um, do, do you have some some good some good how tos around just being able to experience that with your audience, and not not so much 
kind of go on that monologue with, you know, breaks of silence, but being able to maybe like pause, ask a question, like, have you ever done this? And the audience answers, yes, and bring it back. So, so I guess my question is, I like to ramble a little bit. <laughs> yeah, uh, I hear um, what you're saying. I would say don't do that during a story because then people want to start talking about their thing. Yes. Um, just make sure your stories are tight enough that you're not rambling. If you sense that you're losing people, get to the next exciting bit as quickly as you can and see if there's something that you can skip, which with practice, your brain will start to edit on things. Um, but I feel like, you know, if you're doing a talk or if you're having a conversation, you do need to keep people engaged. But actually... Sometimes just with a tone of voice. So I have a book that just came out, which is um, where I've been interviewing stand-up comedians about the art of stand-up comedy. And one thing that one of the comics said is that if he senses he's losing the audience, he'll just... Actually, I think it was Hannibal Barres, who's oh one of the gosh. writers for... I, yeah. I love him. He, he okay, is, so <laughs> He's one of the funniest guys. Like, it's insane. He's really good. So what he said is that sometimes if he senses he's losing, losing the audience, he'll just say one word louder than all of the others. So if I said that again, if he senses he's losing his audience, he'll just say one word louder than all the others. And the audience are like, what? What just happened? And so, and so exactly what you were saying earlier about tone of voice. I mean, if you're telling an entire story in this monotone and it goes on for a really long time, then people are going to lose you. But if you, can, if you can speed up and slow down and get more excited and less excited, that's going to keep them engaged. But generally I would be like, just try and tell better stories. Practice them. Practice them out loud. Practice them on people who are low stakes. Practice them on your best friends before you go out and start practicing them. Or practice them on total strangers who you're never going to see again. Yes. But practice your stories. Edit them down. Know your audience. I had one group of friends who for ages I was like, it was a, a, some people that I worked with back when I lived in Scotland. And there was so long where I'd be like, why am I not charming with these people? Like my stories just, stories that kill everywhere else, just totally died with these people. And, um, and then one time one of them told a story about a time when I was with him. And as he was telling it, I was like, that didn't happen and that didn't happen. And I realized, oh, all of them edit their stories down and spice them up, edit down and spice up. So when I was with them, when I would tell stories, I would edit them the hell down and I would spice them the hell up. And then finally my stories started hitting with them. So, so learn your audience by listening to their stories. And really I feel like that's such a key, key. You can do all the practicing you like, but one of the best ways to get good at storytelling is listen to stories. Like listen to the Moth podcast, which is free on iTunes. Go on YouTube and search for True Stories Told Live Toronto. We have a bunch of stories up there. There's also Moth stories on YouTube too. Listen to other people telling stories with a scientist mind. Start figuring out what it is you do and don't like about their stories. Figure out what you, you know, what who tells bad stories, why you think their stories are bad. Who tells good stories? What it, Which parts of their stories were good what was the response that you had why do you think that they managed to be good start kind of putting on your scientist coat and dissecting stories and listen to as many as you can and that's how you'll get really good so i just want to really call out what you said because this is something i feel like 90 percent of people will not do which is test and test and test and test stories it's so crucial to actually like you said put on that that scientist lab coat and and really Start listening to stories and try to pick out what are the moments that you feel sucked into the story? What are the moments that, that you feel an emotional attachment to the, the uh, storyteller? It's funny, there's a really, I'm sure you've seen this documentary, it's Comedian. I, I believe that's the name of it. It's, oh, with Jerry Seinfeld. Yes, um, with Jerry Seinfeld. Um, you know what, I haven't seen it, but Orny Adams is in the book, the guy that's his like, support on that tour. On the tour oh, cool. Movie. But yeah, what, what's amazing about it is all these stand-up comics, they say that they're going on like Leno or Letterman, uh, which aren't even around anymore. Gosh, I'm old. Uh, so say that they're going on late night TV and it's super important. Well, they're not going to uh, trot out new material that they've never used before. They're going to have like well, well uh, honed stories and right. well honed jokes that they know kills. So just that, that, that whole notion of, of just being, being a student of stories. And if you, can, if you can narrow down and just get maybe three, three different stories that you can pull out in almost any situation, like you're basically, you're set for a long time. Would you agree? Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. And in terms of one of the questions I get asked a lot is like, which story should I tell? Where do I find those stories? Mm. And I feel like um, 
one of them is, I mean, if, in terms of telling stories on stage, like what are the stories that you find telling, you're telling to your friends over and over again? In terms of just telling anywhere, what are stories that other friends tell about times when you were there? I feel like your why story of like why it is that you do the thing that you're most passionate about, whether that's your business or, or your job or a hobby, that's often a good one. Relationships, a relationship is important in a story, but it could be like my relationship to this pen in front of me. <laughs> or, um, you know, someone, we had a, one storyteller who told a story about getting a, being in a, in a bike accident and having a really bad concussion and I felt like that was kind of her relationship to her own sense of intelligence and so having a relationship and another really easy one always is a transformation I was this then this happened now I'm that and it doesn't have to be like I was completely broke and like couldn't walk and all my hair fell out and now I'm super <laughs> rich and I'm running five marathons and I've got a lustrous locks and like I got it can hair, be something yeah. tiny um, but a transformation is people always like this, but I feel like it really, it doesn't have to be that spectacular. Just go into the visual images. What did it look like? How did I feel? Make people care about you in that moment, um, by, by showing them what it looked like and how you felt and by staying out of the voiceover of like, this is, this is what I thought about the situation. Here's how I look back on the situation and don't throw in spoilers. That's another, that's another. So those are the two Ooh. things. One is people do voiceover. And the other thing is people throw in spoilers. And what I mean by throwing spoilers is like, you have to tell us what happened in the chronological order it happened to you. Um, so, so you t t tell tell your story about Snake, Jeff. I was walking out, and my wife said, "Hey, you can use my car today." And um, I was I was coming around the front driver's side tire, and then I looked down, and there's this gigantic snake. I mean, I've never I've never seen a snake this big outside of a, a zoo. And it's got its head cocked. I've seen, I've seen Indiana Jones. Um, <laughs> I know what a snake looks like when it's about to strike. And that's what I saw. And so I did like a moonwalk. And uh, I did my and best. And how did you Michael feel? Johnson. And I felt, I felt like, oh, no, this is it. This is, this is how I die right here. I'm bitten <laughs> by a snake in my carport. Okay. So I know because you told me the story earlier that the snake actually turned out not to be a snake that could bite you. But you didn't know that. Whereas if you told that story and say, and I saw this massive snake, and it turns out it's not poisonous, but I didn't know that. Suddenly we don't care anymore about the snake and about you because we know it's not poisonous. The stakes are low. I'm re-watching. I am, much to my great consternation, I'm a huge fan of, Game of Thrones, to my consternation because it hates women so much, but it's a really compelling show. Um, I'm such a huge fan that I'm re-watching season one at the moment, and without giving away any spoilers, because Game of Thrones, there's nudity and people die, um, somebody dies at the end of the first season, and I'm finding it very hard to care about this character as I'm watching, because I'm thinking, well, you're going to die anyway. Whereas when I watched it the first time around, I really cared about the character. So don't throw in spoilers, like don't make us... Don't make us not care, but also don't make us reverse engineer. Don't say, you know, now I'm going to tell you the story about when I walked out and a piano almost fell on my head. Because then every building you walk under, we're like, is that the piano building? Is that the piano building? And we stop listening to you. So those are my two main tips is like, keep it in action scene, not voiceover, and don't throw in spoilers. Yes, I, I complete, completely agree. And it's so funny that you say like, you find it hard to watch that season because you you know how it ends. Like if you've been if you ever been talking to to a friend and and they're like, yeah, I saw this movie. I can't believe so and so died at the end. And and you're just like, thanks, wow. Now, now you weren't bother watching the movie. I don't I don't want to see the movie at all. And you're not my friend anymore. Um, exactly, exactly. So don't do the same thing with your stories. Don't make people not want to listen to your story because you threw in the spoiler right at the beginning. And let me ask you this, because this is my sneaking suspicion. Um, a reason people might throw in those spoilers, it could be because they, they might feel a little uncomfortable with the spotlight, and they want to kind of get that, attention's not quite the right word, but that spotlight, and, they, and, and it's almost like they, don't, they feel like an imposter syndrome towards um, kind of, kind of that beam of light. And so they think, Oh, well, I just want to get what I say and throw it over here and then leave. You know, what's interesting is a friend of mine was telling, there was like a bunch of us and we were asking her about a new romance she's having. And she was like, Oh, he's this guy. Blah, blah, blah. And we're like, tell us more, tell us more. And then she said afterwards, Oh, I always feel like, you know, if I'm on the spotlight, I don't want to, it's, it's like, it's a, a disrespectful for me to take up too much time. And I said, it's way more disrespectful for you to take up time with a boring story than it is for you to take up more time, but engage us by actually going into detail. 
And so if you're, if you don't like having the spotlight on you, make sure that it's worth, you're worthy of having it on you and make sure that your story is good. If you throw in the spoiler, then the whole, the whole story is a waste of time for everyone. I love that. And that, and it's such a, a beautiful reframe of going from, I'm, I'm frightened of the spotlight to it's my obligation to shine yeah. in the spotlight because I'm in the spotlight. I, I'm, I'm going to enjoy it and I'm going to really make everyone's day a little brighter when, and, when the attention's on me. And also because if you're frightened of the spotlight, then probably like me, you're someone who's more shame driven <laughs> than reward driven. <laughs> and so yeah. I'm shaming you into telling the stories. <laughs> like say that you have someone and, and now like they've listened to this podcast and they're, they're now on the hunt for stories in their own life and they want to be observant from this day forward. What what would you tell them about how to be observant and keep an eye out for those stories? Is it is it as simple as just kind of really taking an internal check and, and, and seeing like how did I feel in this situation? How did I feel in that situation? Yeah, but I would do it at the end of the day because you need to live your life. You can't be through being like, oh, this would be a good story. This would be, be a good story. I mean, I certainly spent quite a lot of my 20s like that <laughs> <laughs> and got into a lot of situations that were like not a fun night or a good story. Um, but uh, that sounds really dark. I don't mean dark at all. I just mean like, oh, it's six in the morning and now I'm just like talking to some strange girl who I don't even have anything in common with. Um but yeah, I guess, I guess review the events of your day and see if there's any of them. But sometimes, you know what I would say actually is a final thing of like which stories you tell is actually, and I find this with my storytelling. So for my storytelling show, True Stories Told Live, there's no theme. Um, and the only requirements are that you've been to at least one show and that you want to tell a story. So anyone could come and we have a lot of people who've never, um, never been on stage in their entire life before, or they've only ever been on stage as like an improv or an actor or a musician. They've never told their stories. And sometimes Sometimes people come to me with five different stories and I say, okay, well, let's start with the one that you want to tell the most. Or sometimes people aren't saying, oh, I don't know if I have a story. And I say, well, just have a little think about it and see if the, and usually people have like at least one story that's bursting out of them that they want to tell. So I feel like pay attention to that, like pay attention to which one you want to tell. And it's much more important to tell a story that you want to tell than it is to tell one that you think will be a good story. Because the one that you want to tell, you will super get behind and you'll want to make it a great story and you will be passionate in that story as opposed to one that you feel you should tell because you think it might be a good story you're not going to care so much and it's so it's interesting how being authentic and being true to that story it really colors everything that happens after that so you're obviously there are going to be subtle things in your subcommunication that are really going to make that story sing as opposed to like oh i think people are really going to like the snake story well here i go and right there's there's definitely a difference there yeah, and I think, you know, there is some value in thinking people are going to like this. Like this next story, my snake story earlier that you touched on is where I basically had to move out of my apartment because there was a deadly snake in it. Oh, and, my gosh. Um, it is crazy. It really <laughs> resonates with me because I have my own snake-related experience. Right. And I'm going exactly. to be linking that in the show notes for sure. Um but, um, but, you know, there is sometimes value in being like, well, that is a great story, but, but you do have to care about it. And the other thing I'd say is if something's happened that was emotionally hard for you, you need distance from it because your story, your audience needs to feel safe. You know, I can tell that story about my granny dying because it happened, whatever it was, seven years ago. And I told it, the first time I told it on stage was maybe two or three years after she died, but it was far enough that I was away from the grief, whereas I couldn't have told it you know, three months after she died, because I would have just fallen apart on stage and been so sad. And so make sure that your audience feels safe. Make sure that you have emotional distance. You can be affected by it. You know, often I've seen people on stage crying at stories that they didn't think they were sad about anymore, because there is something about the experience of telling a story on stage that feels like time travel. And um, even when, you know, I've even told stories to my friends, and I've started crying halfway through. But it's usually where I'm kind of remembering the memory of me being sad or talking about it has made me emotional is very different from falling apart. So make sure that you feel safe enough to tell it. Yeah, I, I absolutely love that. You've uh, been in the room in Toronto where all these, all these storytellers have gotten on stage, some of them for the very first time. What is the vibe like in that room after the event or like after someone comes down from stage? Like, do, do they actually seem... Like, have you noticed a change in them sometimes? Yeah, totally. Always. Every time. It's amazing. It's amazing. I mean, one of the things with my show is I have this really, really big onus when I start the show on, in a kind, funny way, making sure nobody talks and nobody 
has their phone on and nobody looks at their phone. Just because when I'm in a show, if someone's looking at their phone, I'm just reading their text messages. I stop listening to whoever's on stage. And I mean, without them knowing that I'm reading their text messages, that's just what my eyeballs do. And so I have this really big earnest. So my audience is super, super focused. There's a big storytelling scene in Toronto. And a lot of the other storytellers are always like, whoa, your audience are amazing. Because they're so focused. And then afterwards, people are so jazzed. And it depends on what the story is. You know, sometimes it's a really intense one. And everyone afterwards is just like, whoa. Often it'll be a really funny one. And everyone afterwards is in kind of slightly hysterical high spirits. It's always a lovely, lovely atmosphere. And at the at the risk of kind of sounding like a curmudgeoned old man, it, it feels like, uh, especially in the time and history that, that we're recording this, it's because you mentioned the phone thing and you mentioned like, it, it just feels sometimes like our attention as a culture, it's completely fragmented. And one thing that, that the really good stories allow us to do is they allow us to focus on one singular thing. And I, uh, it feels like it's increasingly... Uh, rare with you know constant dings and interruptions yeah and you know what I would say it's, it, for me it's less about focus and it's more about connection mm. I was talking about my storytelling show to a friend of mine Jill Farmer uh, who's an amazing coach life coach and um, and she was saying it's because you're it's because you're speaking pilot like to pilot like and that's how it feels when you're telling a story really well and someone is totally into it is it does feel like your pilot like speaking to their pilot like and I feel like I'm like I'm a huge fan of social media and I have one of my best friends lives in Sydney like 15 hours ahead of me she is literally around the other side of the world from where I am in Toronto um so I I have no problem with like online communication and things but I think there is something very very magical about connecting there's this alchemy that happens you know I can write a story and it does something for me in writing it and you can read that story and it does something for you in reading it but there is this magic that happens between two people or between one people and a room full of people when they tell a story live when you're both having that experience I mean as I said your brains are literally in sync with each other it's so futuristic and also like historical um and so I think there's just this alchemy that happens when you're both in that space you know it's this kind of it transports you both and it isn't something that we get you know I love tv and I love movies but they're, they're very passive mediums. You sit back and they do all the work for you. And this is actually how I get people not to talk in the storytelling show, is I always say, you know, when people are telling their stories on stage, we have a sign on the door after the show starts saying, please enter quietly. People are opening their souls in public because that's how it feels. But I always say, you know, one of the things that I love about storytelling is unlike TV and movies, which are a passive medium, with storytelling, you as the listener are an active part of that story. And so if you talk, you're not only spoiling it for the storyteller, and the people around you but you're spoiling it for yourself you don't get to have that experience and that's why nobody talks in my show also they're scared too <laughs> <laughs> also like you have like an axe like you know Game of Thrones <laughs> style it's like you know I'm, I'm not saying I would use the axe but it's here Actually, something that I'll do, which is a hint for anyone who's putting on events, um, is from, so there's, a, there's a, a gentleman here called Misha Gluberman who hosts a show in Toronto, and he does this thing, which I steal from him and credit him, where he encourages people to shush each other, and if they don't want to be seen to be shushing, he encourages them to shush behind their hand so they can shush anonymously, and I think when you tell people to do that, everybody laughs when you're telling them, but then what you're saying is basically, if you start talking, you're going to look like an idiot, and I'm going to shush you. So I encourage them to police each other. No acts necessary. Nice. And so, yeah, it it's a self uh, perpetuating thing where uh, no one's going to be talking, which is which is awesome. Which is so I feel like that's so rare. Yeah. Um, yeah. Exactly. Exactly. But I mean, I basically one of the joys of running your own show is you can just run the show the way you want to run it. I spoke to someone the other day who said, so one of the things we have all the, all the, I basically, I have the microphone on the ground in front of the stage because I wanted it to be more intimate because it's a big, big room. So the, the storytellers are literally standing, you know, a feet away from the listeners. And then I have tables scattered throughout the chairs. And this guy the other day was like, you have so little room for chairs. Everybody is crammed in together, knee to back. Why do you have those tables? And I was like, because I would want tables if I was in the audience. <laughs> I want somewhere to put my drink. Yes, I love it. Um, well, I mean, we've been talking for about an hour, and, and it's just flown by. Um, awesome, it has. And uh, something that always strikes me because I've I've read quite a few of your uh, blog posts. Watched, I mean, we hang out, we hang out on the periscopes. Yeah, uh, which is what the kids are doing nowadays. Um, and the grown ups. And I'm I'm constantly blown away, like the authenticity that that you bring to every conversation that you have. 
Yeah. You know what, though? Awesome. Most, people, most people I know in this kind of online business space came from a corporate background where you're really encouraged to squash your personality down. And I think I'm just lucky that I grew up in this incredibly eccentric family where I was the most normal person by a country mile. <laughs> and then I went straight into radio where all you have is your personality. Like, you're just a disembodied voice. And so everything I've done, I've always been encouraged to push my personality front and center. And you know, to, 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 I learned pretty early on to not be afraid to make a fool of myself and to realize that actually people like you more rather than less when you do. You know, that, that is so powerful. And if you could offer some advice, like say that there's someone listening and they're thinking like, you know what, I, the, the me I project to the outside world is, I feel like it's a little different than the me I look at in, in the mirror. What advice would you, would you give that person? I would be like saying the storytelling practice. And if it's scary, like practice a little bit at a time. You know, next time you're out with your friends, just be like, I like dogs in costumes or something. Like just <laughs> say one little tiny thing. Um, but practice a little bit at a time. And what you will realize is that it's it's terrifying at first. You'll get a massive vulnerability hangover. And then you'll realize that actually it's fine. And that the more you do it, the more fine it is. You know, one of the things that I teach, so I teach storytelling and I also teach networking. And one of the things that I teach in networking is about how to approach people when you're going to a conference, if you're terrified. And I'm able to teach that because I spent years and years and years like that, but also because now still when I go to a conference, if I don't know anyone there on the first day, my internal monologue is going, oh my God, I'm not going to know anyone. Everyone's going to be friends. They're going to think I'm a dirtbag because I'm not dressed fancy enough. And, and all of that happens. But history has taught me that if I go up to people and start conversations, it will be okay. And the first two or three is quite scary. And then after that, it stops being scary. So I think in the same way, start letting little bits of your personality out wear the pink shirt if you want to wear the pink shirt and like maybe on the first day everyone will be like oh Gary's in a pink shirt but then you know they'll get over it no one's thinking about you as much as you are they're all thinking about themselves the same amount that you're thinking about yourself so just try letting little bits of it out a little bit at a time and then it's and then it'll feel so much better it'll feel great and uh, to quote, I believe this is you, where where you, you said, uh, "Don't compare your your insides to other people's outsides." To other people's outsides, yes, that's actually Jonathan Fields. From oh Good yes, Life, me yes, that. that's that, yeah. yeah. Don't compare your insides to other people's outsides, which is true. And I feel like I'm always a perfect example of that because so often I'm in situations, and when it's a new situation, on the inside I am quivering, but on the outside I look like I'm overconfident because I force myself to be that because that's actually how I would ultimately like to be and how I know I'm capable of being. And so if I force myself to do it then I can get comfortable with it and then I can just do it naturally sometimes if you if you feel on the inside like you're that kind of big bowl of jello but you're you're, you're cool calm and collect on the outside over time sometimes not not very much one two three approaches then uh, those two will line up because I, I think we as humans we, we we like being congruent with ourselves more than anything and if you mm -hmm. can just kind of key in on well you know what my hand's not shaking I am I'm smiling I'm doing pretty well like I mean, I'll let you in on a secret. And it's just you and me here and all my listeners. <laughs> What's so, the secret? What's the secret? Just, just a little no secret. Like, I, I get quite nervous before each podcast. Uh, and it, it doesn't matter who I interview. Like, I, I get nervous. But then what actually seems to calm me down more than anything is actually I go back and listen to the first few seconds of previous podcasts. And then it's like, oh, well... I mean, it's always I, fine. I seem fine. I, don't, <laughs> I, I guess I'm fine. I guess I'm just kind of, you know... You know what's funny? I um, I used to do a podcast. This is actually the, the book about stand-up comedy came out of this podcast that I did called Marsha Meets, where I would interview, do these kind of in-depth um, hour-long interviews with stand-up comedians. And, uh, and before every single one, like every single one, I would be in the studio with my producer, with my producer saying they're downstairs, I have to go and get them, and me going, send them home! Tell them I'm sick! I can't do it! And, and then it was always fun. So I know exactly, exactly, exactly how you feel. But this is, you know, it's, it's, it's um, what Amy Cuddy talks about in her amazing TED Talk, fake mm -hmm. it, not fake it till you make it, but fake it until you become it. Yeah. And that was what being shy was like for me. I was desperately shy with new people up until I was like in my early 20s. With my friends, you couldn't shut me up. But with new people, I'm completely silent. And people would say, oh, you're really quiet. And I'd think, I'm not, you don't know me. But then what I did was I just pretended I wasn't. And then I remember the moment of being like, wow, I pulled it off. Everyone thinks I'm confident. And then after that, kind of having this realization of like, oh, if everyone thinks I'm confident and I'm always acting like I'm confident, then maybe. <laughs> 
Maybe I accidentally became confident. Maybe I accidentally became confident, exactly. Um, so, Jeff, I'm going to make you a secret webpage. Talking of secrets. Secrets. Secret webpage. And I'll put the Amy Cuddy TED Talk on there because it's one of my favorite things I've ever seen in my whole life. Awesome. And links to a couple of other things we talked about. And that's a perfect segue because on this webpage, hopefully via the, the magic of the internet, you can make this happen too, is uh, you, you have a really fantastic guide on specifically something that I struggle with for, for years, which is remembering remembering people's names. Yes. Um, so, such a small thing, but so crucial. If you're talking to someone and what, and I don't want to give away the surprise because I, I have a hunch it's on the other side of, uh, of, of that guy, but there's, there's a method that you can use. It that, is. You know what? I'll give a hint. Strong visual images. Again, it's all about the visual images, Jeff. And you know, it's amazing because say that you, you meet someone and then a month later you run into the beginning like, Hey Mike, how's it going? And they're like, you remember my name. Yeah, it's charmed by stuff. But that's the thing is, I think people don't even notice that you remember their name. They just feel amazing whenever they're around you. Because ultimately, we all want to be remembered. Yeah, that's exactly. A, a basic human human need. Yeah. Food, water, shelter, and be remembered. Yeah, exactly. You're being seen, truly seen and truly heard. I, I have absolutely loved this conversation. Um, Me too. That was so fun. And uh, the URL is going to be yes, yes, Marsha slash become more compelling. I'll... I'll link to it in the, yes. in the show notes. It'll also be in the podcast description as well. Okay, um, yesismarsha.com forward slash become more compelling. Yes, and if it's okay, I actually have a gift for your readers as well. Oh, yeah. Uh, because, you know, I, I actually just read this book called Give and Take by... Adam Grant, amazing. Adam Grant, uh, which it's, it's an amazing book. And it covers so many incredible things. Uh, and so I'm, I'm in kind of a giving mood. I actually created a quick guide on creating fantastic first impressions and oh, brilliant. and ways that ways that people can specifically kind of almost use it as like a cheat sheet to okay I know if I'm meeting someone here are the things that I need to focus on uh, here are the things I can compliment them on and the more and more kind of down the, the rabbit hole of charisma and social skills I get the more and more I learn it's not so much what you say it's it's how can you make yourself comfortable so can you give me an example of one of them? Just a, just a hint. So a if, tease. if we were, if we were meeting for the first time, say, say that we had no, no prior contact, like, yeah, I would say like, Hey, Hey Marsha, it's, it's uh, it's really fantastic to meet you. Oh, and, 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 I, and I just noticed that scarf that you're wearing. It's amazing. I, I can't believe that, uh, well now I'm going off on a tangent, but like <laughs> I'm picturing like tiny yellow, uh, you know, sort of the, uh, the bath toy ducks. I and would so, wear that. I, I mean, I've seen you in a scarf before. I think it was on your first Periscope. So I know your scarf game is strong. Uh, <laughs> and so I would just give you a little compliment. Like, hey, I, awesome. love, I love that scarf. And love just it. something to make them feel good about the choices that they made when they left the house this morning. Nice. Which, uh, is, Ooh, I love that. Is awesome. I so steal that. I'll I, I tell you what, I'll, I'll make a custom URL, becomemorecompelling.com slash yes, yes, Marsha. Awesome. Now, and that'll be a fantastic gift for your readers. Okay, well. awesome. Thank you. Very cool. I'm excited. So uh, it, it's, it's just been a pleasure. We'll have to do it again. Speaking of time travel, it's like an hour ago we hopped on the phone and now it's like, <laughs> boom, it's already over. I know, I know. It's like we just started talking, but you're less nervous. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's all underneath the surface. I definitely power posed before. <laughs> you did good. Uh, the yeah, podcast. power pose is from the Amy Cuddy thing, and it's yeah, it's a game changer. I remember, I remember the first time I tried the power pose. So this is in the Amy Cuddy video that I'll link on the secret web page. Um, but I remember being at a storytelling show and I was telling a story and, uh, and I was about to go on stage and I felt totally, you know, I've done this now a ton of times before I felt totally comfortable and then suddenly it was about my time to go on and I suddenly felt like I wanted to vomit, like my stomach dropped and I thought, this is not a pleasant experience that I'm having right now. And then I was like, oh, Amy Cuddy power poses and it's all about making yourself big. So I was sitting on chairs at the, at the time. So I basically just like opened my legs really wide like a guy, like spread my arms out over the two chairs next to me and it totally worked. Two minutes later, I was calm and I went on stage and it went gangbusters. So yeah, it's so funny that you bring that up because I, I actually went through a period where, where I power posed for probably four to six months and every single time for the first 30 seconds, I would be like, this is stupid. <laughs> why, why am I doing it? And then like everything in my, in my, in my biology would rebel against doing this. But then the last 30 seconds I would be like, okay, the, well, you know what? This is actually fantastic. I'm really enjoying this. So yeah. It's so funny how sometimes we, the things that are going to help us out aren't always the things that are going to be the most comfortable starting out. 
Yes, absolutely. I would say most of the things that help us out are not the most comfortable starting out. Almost always. Otherwise, we'd all be making a great living lying on the couch watching Game of Thrones. That's true. That's true. <laughs> well, I'm going to let you. I'm going to let you go, and uh, I, I, I've just enjoyed this conversation. Thank you so much for being on Become More Compelling Radio. Thanks for having me. It was so fun. 